Well, good morning, church. Oh, come on. Good morning, church. Man, Dave Ramsey had some energy in that financial peace video. I'm going to do my best. Run, run, run. <coughs> I need to drink water now. Hey, if you got a Bible, turn them to Genesis chapter 19. And while you're turning there, I got a few more announcements that didn't make the video. Uh, so... Uh, just some quick hits that I want you guys to be aware of. Tonight, Pastor Austin is kicking off a new sermon series uh, for Sunday nights. It's called Tough Topics. And this is where our pastors are going to talk about hard things. We're going to talk through uh, tough topics, all kinds of different tough things that we go through in life. And tonight, uh, specifically, is about infertility and the struggle that a lot of people walk through with infertility and experiencing loss through miscarriages and things of that nature. And Pastor Austin uh, is going to be speaking tonight on how we can be the church uh, through that for our people. Uh, and if you're struggling with infertility, you, you may know my story. My wife and I, we, we walked through infertility for, for six years before we had a baby. And uh, Pastor Austin gave me his sermon and said, hey, read this over and tell me what's terrible and what's good. And so I, I know that he's got some great stuff, some great content for tonight. You don't want to miss it. And you don't want to miss uh, Sunday nights. I think this is the next five weeks or so. Uh, we're going to be talking through tough topics. So make sure you're here tonight at 6 p.m. right in this room. Uh, it's worth it. And then today... At 4 p.m., uh, there is meeting. There's a meeting with missionaries, uh, Paul and Christy Robinson. They are missionaries to the National Police in Colombia. Uh, National Police. So this is going to be great for first responders and any, well, anyone else who is interested uh, in what's happening with the ministry to the National Police in Colombia. And that's happening today, 4 p.m. in room uh, 224. Gay Wilson has more information uh, if you need it from her. If you don't find her, just find Marvin. He loves to answer her questions. Okay. Okay. That's what happens when you're married. So, yeah, last announcement is today is a very special day because our very own Pastor Luke, who happens to be in the other room uh, this morning, turns 31 today. Praise God. Yeah, he's an old man. He's getting gray hairs. Uh, he's forgetting a lot of things now. Um, man, just a lot's going on with him. So, obviously, say happy birthday, but also pray for him. Uh, he needs it. He needs those blessings. So, man, I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. We're talking through uh, the book of Genesis, and we've been walking through the book of Genesis, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 19 this morning. But before we get there, let's kind of recap. Let's remember what we've what we've walked through, what we've talked through, uh, where we've been. Excuse me, where we've been so far in this journey with Abraham and his family. Remember, God called Abraham to walk with him. God spoke to Abraham and said. Abraham, follow me, and Abraham followed him. He chose to take a step out of his comfort zone and to begin to walk with the Lord, begin a lifelong journey with God, and, and God promised Abraham and his wife Sarah, and we remember they were once Abram and Sarai, but now we've, we've already gotten to Genesis chapter 17, so their names have been changed to Abraham and, and Sarah, and so we know that God promised Abraham and Sarah a son, and, and he said, through your offspring, through your child, through your uh, descendants, you will have kids who walk with me. You will have a family that walks close with me, and then that child will have children, and then those children will have children, and then those children will have children, and then you'll have so many descendants that they won't be able to be counted, just like the sea on the seashore or the stars in the night sky. And, and we remember Abraham, we've, we've watched as, as, as Abraham received this promise from God, the promise that not only would he have uh, an uncountable amount of descendants, but that through his descendants, the Messiah would come. The Savior would come. This man that we know today uh, as Jesus Christ would come from the line of Abraham. And, and we've watched as Abraham took in his nephew Lot because he, he was old and he didn't have a son, and so he said, maybe I'll take in my nephew who doesn't have a father, and he can become my heir, and then we watched as God said, that's not my plan for you, and so he separated uh, from his nephew Lot, and, and if you missed any of these sermons, make sure you go to our YouTube page, and you can check them all out there, and, and we continue the story. We watched as Abraham and Sarah said, okay, we're, we're old, we don't have children yet, and, and Lot wasn't going to be our heir, that's what God said, so now we kind of, we're getting to that point where it's not going to 
to happen. And so we need to take, uh, take this into our own hands. We need to take our own life uh, in our own hands. And we need to make this happen. And so this is where Hagar and, and Ishmael enter the story. And if you remember, we know that that also wasn't God's plan for Abraham and his family. But because of human decisions not based on God's will or God's plan, we have Hagar and Ishmael introduced into this story and introduced into the family line of, of Abraham. And, and I kind of love that story because it's a testimony of God's love and faithfulness to all people. And it's a foreshadowing of Jesus would do for, for all of us by welcoming, welcoming us into the family of God through reconciliation and adoption. And then last week, finally, we're here. Whew, take a breath, man. That was a lot. Last week, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Zach, they talked about God's covenant with Abraham's family and, and the power of the covenant and, and the power of who God is. He's our uh, El Shaddai, Almighty God. And, and now we're here at a very strange spot in the Bible. We pick up at a spot where God and, and two angels, this is uh, Genesis 18, we're not going to read that, but Genesis 18, starting in verse 26, God and, and two angels, they're meeting with Abraham and Sarah, they're reconfirming the promise that you're going to have a son, and then uh, they begin to have a conversation, God and the angels begin to have a conversation about the cities of the plain, two of those cities that we know today as Sodom and Gomorrah. And that happens in, like I said, uh, chapter 18, verse 26, all the way through the end of chapter 18. And so the Lord begins to have a conversation with Abraham. And, and he says, Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so terrible that I need to go down there and I need to see if it's as bad as what I've been hearing. Which is strange because God is all knowing. And I don't believe that God didn't know how bad Sodom and Gomorrah was. I believe that God was trying to see where Abraham's heart was when he has this conversation with him. And so God sends his two angels to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends his angels to the plain and, and God stays with Abraham. And he begins to have a conversation and continues to have this conversation with Abraham. And Abraham begins to plead with the Lord, please don't destroy that. But would you destroy that place? You're a just God. You are a good God. You are a righteous God. Would you really destroy that place if there were righteous people found there? And some of us know the story. If you don't, Abraham says, if there's 50 righteous people, if you find 50 righteous people in the cities, will you destroy it? What about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? And finally, through this conversation that Abraham has with God, the number gets down to 10. And so God says, I will not destroy the cities if the angels find 10 righteous people there. And so this story that we're about to read is from the Bible, okay? But it is wild. Some of y'all thought R-rated movies were bad. This story's bad. And so this is a quick disclaimer. Don't get mad at Pastor August. If your children are in the room, we're going to read the word sex in the Bible. We're going to read about things that shouldn't happen. We're going to read about evil deeds that men try in, in the city of Sodom. So these are all conversations you're probably going to need to have with your children after this service if they stay in the room right now. And it's not my fault. It's straight from the Bible. Okay? Genesis chapter 19, starting in verse 1. That evening, the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom, and Lot was sitting there. And when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Then he welcomed them and bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, come to my home to wash your feet and be my guests for the night. You may then get up early in the morning and be on your way again. Oh no, they replied, we'll just spend the night out here in the city square. But Lot insisted. So at last they went to the home with him. They went to his house with him. And Lot prepared a feast, complete with fresh bread made without yeast, and they ate. But before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city and surrounded the house. They shouted to Lot, 
Where are the men who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. So Lot stepped outside to talk to them, shutting the door behind him. Let's pause. There's a couple things going on here. Number one, the angels who came, they weren't the winged angels that we see in paintings. These were men. These were uh, angels that looked in men. So, so you can change your mind. You can change, adjust your vision of what these, uh, what these guys looked like. They weren't the, had the big angel wings on the back or nothing. These were, they looked like normal men. Second thing, all of the men, all of them, young and old. This is wild to me because what that tells us is that the old men taught their, taught their sons wickedness and evil. Church, if we want the world to be a different place, we have to begin to teach our kids differently. We have to teach our kids differently. We have to raise our kids differently so that they won't show up with evil intentions like the young, the young men did in Sodom. All right, so continuing on. Verse six, Lot stepped outside to talk to them, shutting the door behind him. Please, my brothers, he begged, don't do such a wicked thing. Look, I have two virgin daughters. Let me bring them out to you and you can do with them as you wish. But please leave these men alone for they are my guests and are under my protection. Stand back, they shouted. This fellow came to town as an outsider and now he's acting like our judge. We'll treat you far worse than those other men and they lunged toward Lot to break down the door. Another wild thing is happening. Lot says, take my daughters. Now I'm a father now, and I have a daughter, and I will throw hands with anybody who comes for her. I can't imagine the evil and wickedness that Lot has experienced so much so that he forgot about the God he worshiped when he was with his uncle Abraham and he would give up his daughters to evil men. We can't forget who our God is. We can't forget to walk with our Lord, church. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, verse 10. But the two angels reached out, pulled Lot into the house and they bolted the door. And then they blinded all the men, young and old, who were at the door of the house, so they gave up trying to get inside. Verse 12, meanwhile, the angels questioned Lot. Do you have any other relatives here in the city, they asked. Get them out of this place, your sons-in-law, your sons, daughters, anyone else, for we are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against this place is so great, it has reached the Lord, and he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancés, quick, he said. Oh, excuse me, I lost my place. To his daughter's fiancés, uh, quick, and get out of the city. The Lord is about to destroy it. But the young men thought he was only joking. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now, or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot hesitated, the angels seized his hand in the hands of his wife and his two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives and don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life and you have shown such great kindness, but I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there and I would soon die. See, there's a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said. I will grant your, your request. I will not destroy the little village. But hurry, escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. And this explains why that village was known as Zoar, which means little place. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and, be, and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utterly destroyed them, along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. No life, no life can survive. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him and she turned into a pillar of salt. Abraham got up early that morning and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. He looked out across the plain toward Sodom and Gomorrah and watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. But God had listened to Abraham's request, kept Lot safe, 
removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities on the plain. Will you pray with me this morning? God, I pray that you would use this word to speak to our hearts. God, I pray that every single person in this room would learn something new from you this morning. God, I pray that every single one of us would, would know that you are with us, would know that your spirit is here, and would hear your voice and hear what we have to learn and hear what you have to say to us. God, speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Wild. That is a wild story, and it's right here in the Bible. And there's a lot to unpack Way too much to unpack for uh, this morning and our time, the time that we have together. But I do believe that there are a few things that we can learn from this. And the first thing that I believe we can learn is Abraham interceded. Point number one is this, Abraham interceded. If you're taking notes, and you should be, because note takers are world changers, write this down. Abraham interceded. Scholars believe that not only was Abraham concerned for the, for the welfare of his nephew Lot, but Abraham <clears throat> it was also compassionate for the people in the cities. And like I said in chapter 18, uh, verses 16 to 33, Abraham and God have a full conversation about the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, he intercedes. What does the word intercede mean? It means that Abraham stood before the Lord and spoke to the Lord on behalf of the people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. He stood before God and began to speak to him on the people's behalf. And it says in chapter 19, verse 29, what we just read, that God listened to Abraham. Abraham's request. God listened to Abraham's request. Verse 29 says that. God listened to Abraham's request. And this is a picture. This is a picture of, of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus is doing in heaven because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf right now. Do you know what that means? That means that God listens to our requests. And when we live a life of obedience uh, and we live a life following Jesus and our requests align with the heart and nature of God, he responds accordingly. When our requests of God align with his nature and his heart because we are living a life of obedience, following after him, becoming more like him, being transformed to uh, becoming Christ-like, using him as our example to live this life. When our requests match the heart of God, God responds accordingly, just like he did for Abraham. There's a few things that we can learn about Abraham being an intercessor. That means that he knew God intimately. He knew God, he had an intimate relationship with God. He was close to God's heart. He was close to God. He had conversations with God. He knew him intimately. And in chapter 18, verse 25, Abraham acknowledges God as the judge of all the earth. He literally says in, in chapter 18, verse 25, it's not on the screen, but he says, surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why? You would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Abraham knew something about God that all of us need to know about God. Abraham knew that God was just, that God was righteous, and that God loved people. And so Abraham said, should not the judge of all the earth do what was right? Do what is right. You know what that means? That means God is the judge of all the earth, and we are not. Come on, church. God is the judge of all the earth, and we are not. We do not condemn we do not pass judgment. As a matter of fact, apart from the grace and mercy that we've received from Jesus, we are just as bad as Sodom, deserving death for the wickedness that's in our own hearts. But thanks be to God that his love for humanity is so great that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he sent his son to die and pay the price that we could not pay. And he reconciled us back to himself. Praise be to God, church, that he is the judge of all the earth and we are not. Who are we but former sinners saved by a gracious and merciful, loving God that we should put ourselves on the throne of judgment against the lost and broken and dying world? Who are we that we should pass judgment? 
Who are we that we should say things like, nope, they got what they deserved? Who are we to watch news stories and say, you know what? That would be okay if those people died. That would be okay if those people weren't around. That would be okay if those people were separated from us. Who are we to pass judgment? Church, I still have memories of who I was before Jesus redeemed my soul. Let us not forget about the grace and mercy that he extended to us and pulled us out of the grave and gave us eternal life. Who are we to pass judgment? Who are we to sit on the throne of judgment? We are not the judge of all the earth, God is. We need to recognize what Abraham recognized. We're called to be salt and light, the hands and feet of Jesus. We're called to show mercy, grace, truth, and intercede on behalf of people who are now blind, but believing and hoping that one day they would encounter Jesus, and then they would be able to see, because amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see how beautiful it would be if the entire world had an encounter with Jesus that changed everything and it started with the believers of this house reaching out to our community Abraham was an intercessor for lost people and so should we be intercessors for lost people even the most wicked even the ones that we deem the most evil, even the ones that we don't like, even the ones that we don't wanna associate with. Abraham was an intercessor, and so should we stand in intercession for people who don't have a relationship with Jesus. What would you do? What would you do if God told you that he was gonna destroy a city or even all of America because of its sin and its wickedness? How would you respond if God came and had a conversation with you that said, Chicago, I'm wiping it off of the face of the map because of its evil. Los Angeles, I'm wiping it off the face of the math because, map excuse me, because of its evil. Des Moines, I'm wiping it off the face of the map because of its evil. Urbandale, I'm wiping it off the face of the map because of its evil. How would you respond? A.W. Tozer, a great theologian, theologian, that's not a real word, theologian, sorry, and scholar, A.W. Tozer, wrote a book called Disruptive Faith. And he says, only love can grieve. You don't grieve if you don't love. And God grieves over people because of their sin. He is a jealous God who fiercely loves and doesn't want anyone to perish. That idea comes from Genesis 6.6. 6. And so church, let me ask you this morning. Do we love the people of the world to the point of grieving? And so we begin to intercede for them. Or do we only see their sin and can't get past how horrible it is and how horrible they must be? Are we a church who intercedes for our community? This morning, I'm gonna ask you to intercede for your community. This morning, I'm gonna ask you to intercede for your family. I'm gonna ask you to intercede for your neighbors. I'm gonna ask you to intercede for your coworkers. I'm gonna ask you to intercede for people that you don't wanna pray for. I'm gonna ask you to intercede for people that you think are too far gone. I'm gonna ask you to intercede for people who make you mad, who upset you, who frustrate you, who anger you. This morning, I'm gonna ask you to respond to Jesus and become intercessors for your community because there is not a single person on this planet who is too far gone to be saved by Jesus. That's point number one. Abraham was an intercessor, and Abraham interceded, and so we should intercede. Point number two is this. Lot got comfortable. That felt a little Dr. Susie. Lot got, right? Lot got comfortable. Verse one of chapter 19 tells us that Lot was sitting in the gates of the city. 
Lot was sitting in the gates of the city of Sodom. Lot did not intend to be there. He intended at first to live in his tent apart from the people. Genesis 13, 12 tells us that. But he was gradually drawn in and he gradually began to dwell in the city. He and he and his family were connected, became connected with the citizens of the city of Sodom by marriage ties. Lot exposed himself and exposed his family to the immorality and the ungodliness of Sodom only to learn the bitter lesson that his family wasn't strong enough to resist its evil influences. Lot got comfortable with sin. Lot got comfortable with wickedness. Lot got comfortable with evil. And because Lot got comfortable, his family paid the price. Because Lot got comfortable, his family paid the price. It was a slow process. Lot and his family, it was a slow process for them from going from Abraham's family who worshiped God and knew God and walked with God to being an official in a city of wickedness who offers up his daughters to wicked and evil men. Scholars say that Lot was most likely a city official because he was sitting in the gates of the city and it's at the gates of the city where city business was done. Pastor Brian is preaching in the chapel right now, and him and I, we prepared this sermon together, and, and we, we just couldn't fathom how, how comfortable Lot got with the wickedness and the evil of the city, that he would move his family into there, and then they would all be lost in wickedness. Church, we may not offer our, up our children outright in a situation like Lot did, and it's completely mind-blowing and wrong to think that someone would consider this, but when we become comfortable with sin, and we begin to tolerate sin, and we begin to think, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. We open the door for the enemy, and we open up the door for those around us to be impacted, because nobody sins in a vacuum. Nobody sins in a vacuum. When we begin to tolerate sin, it begins to ripple through our entire lives and it, it begins to have an impact on our families and all the people around us. Parents, we must be careful not to place ourselves and our kids in any kind of Sodom type situation and we cannot become, uh, we cannot lead our families into spiritual room by becoming comfortable with sin. Church, we cannot lead ourselves to spiritual ruin by becoming comfortable with sin. We cannot lead our families, we cannot lead our communities to spiritual ruin by becoming comfortable with sin. Look what happened to Lot, he lost his testimony. In chapter 19, verse 14, he ran to tell his sons-in-law, hey, this is gonna happen, God is gonna destroy the city because of its wickedness, and what happened? They laughed at him. The city's wicked. Lot, look what you do. Lot, look at your life. You're a city official. Get out of here, man. He lost his testimony. Because he became comfortable with sin, when he ran to tell people you need to be saved by God, they said, we don't need to be saved by God. Look at your life. He lost his testimony. He lost his wife. In chapter 19, verse 26, even though they left the city, her heart was still in it. That's what Luke 17, uh, 32 tells us. Her heart was still in the city. Warren Wearsby, another great theologian and scholar, says Lot had entered Sodom, Lot and his family, they had entered Sodom, and then Sodom had entered Lot, and he found it difficult to leave. Church, we can't allow culture to dictate how we obey the Lord. We can't allow culture around us to dictate how we obey the Lord. The city was attractive to Lot, and culture is attractive to us, and it's attractive to our kids, and it's attractive to people, but we cannot allow that culture to dictate how we obey the Lord, because the Lord told us that we're supposed to live set apart. The Lord told Lot, you're supposed to live set apart, and instead of living set apart, he got drawn into the city, and he allowed culture to dictate how he obeyed the Lord. We cannot allow culture to dictate how we obey the Lord, because our culture is ruled by sin. And here's the truth, sin will take you farther than you want to go, it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you are willing to pay because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death and eternal separation from God. We cannot get so comfortable with sin that we lead ourselves and our communities and our families to spiritual ruin. So let me ask you this morning, what sin are you tolerating? 
What sin have you become comfortable with? What things have you gotten comfortable with and they are separating you from God? God, I pray right now that you would speak to our hearts and you would show us the places. Show us the places where we've become tolerant of sin. Where we've become tolerant of schemes from the devil. We've become tolerant of the things that separate us from you. Family, today is your moment. Today is your moment to surrender those things to Jesus. And like I said, I'm going to ask you to respond and become an intercessor. I'm also going to ask you and challenge you to respond and surrender those things to Jesus. I'm going to challenge you to step out of your comfort zone this morning to become an intercessor and surrender the things that we tolerate, surrender the sins that we've become comfortable with here at this altar. Because we cannot become so comfortable with sin that we lose our lives. My last point this morning is this, God was merciful. God was merciful. God was merciful. Point number one, Abraham interceded. Point number two, Lot got comfortable. But point number three, God was merciful. Church, Sodom, this story, it's meant to be an example to the entire world and to all of us now that sin cannot survive forever. It will become totally eradicated. It will be totally eradicated from the world. Sin cannot survive for, uh, forever. And I want you to understand something. Sodom was known for its sexual immorality, like the homosexuality that we read about in the story, but that wasn't its only sin and it isn't the only focus. Homosexuality was a sin then and it's a sin today. Just like sex outside of marriage was a sin then and it's a sin today. Just like pride and gossip and anger and gluttony and unforgiveness was a sin then and it's a sin today. The point is this, sin will not and cannot survive. One day God will eradicate all sin and God will eradicate those who have chosen to give their lives over to it in eternal separation from him. And so we have to eradicate sin from our lives. Sin cannot and it will not survive. And it cannot and will not survive in our lives. But the question is, is why was God's judgment lingering? If Sodom was so bad, why didn't God just destroy it from the jump? Why did he have to have a conversation with Abraham? It's because God is what we call long suffering. Another word for that is patient. God is patient. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that he is not willing for anyone to perish, but that all people would come to repentance. God does not want any person to live in separation from him. He wants all people to come to repentance. He wants all people to choose eternal life with him. He wants all people to know his presence. He wants all people to know his grace. He wants all people to know his mercy. He wants all people to know his love because he is a merciful God. And there will be a day when God will give man over to his depravity and those who have been saved by grace, washed in the blood of the sacrifice, will live eternally forever with him, while those who chose sin will experience eternal hell separated from God forever. A day is coming when that will happen. When those who chose Jesus, who are washed in the blood, will be called home. And those who didn't will be condemned by the judge of the whole earth forever to live in eternal separation, to live in eternal hell. But church, listen to me. Listen to me this morning. Until that day comes, it is the heart of God that all humanity would be saved and that all humanity would be reconciled to him and that all humanity would join the family of God. What we learn here today is that to live following God, we have to completely eradicate sin from our lives, even though we still live in a world and a culture that resembles Sodom more and more each day. We have to totally and completely eradicate sin from our lives while we continue to live in a culture, while we continue to live in a world that continues to look like Sodom. Lot was unable to do this. 
Lot didn't have the Holy Spirit in his life. But we're given the power, the ability, and the opportunity to live sin free because of the grace of God and the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives. All the while having a heart of compassion to people who are still lost in sin and who are still blinded by it. Church, we are called to live in a perpetual cycle of not sinning while having compassion for those who still are. And it's hard and it's difficult and it's a point of tension for all of us, but it's the life that we've been called to live. A life that intercedes. A life that as we get closer to Jesus, we realize how much of a wretch we are and that we need his saving grace every day. And then as we continue to get closer to Jesus, we get his eyes to see lost people, not condemned for their actions, but com with compassion and humility saying they deserve to know Jesus. They deserve to have hope. They deserve to have grace. They deserve to have mercy. And I will be his hands and feet. I will be tools in his hands to reach lost people. I I will shine his light in the darkness. Church, God was merciful. God is still merciful. And God is calling us to be people of mercy. Will you stand with me all over this room? When we draw closer to Jesus, we get to know his heart, which means that we get further away from sin, but we also get more compassion into the world who is still stuck in it. So our prayer this morning is, God, break our heart for what breaks yours. And let me tell you right now, lost people break the heart of God. Lost people grieve his heart. So how do we respond to a story like this? I believe we respond in two ways. Response number one is this, where in my life do I resemble Sodom? Where in my life am I tolerating sin? Where in my life am I, have I gotten comfortable with sin? It's easy to say I don't resemble Sodom because I, I don't have sexual immorality in my life like Sodom did. And yes, they were known for sexual immorality, but that wasn't the only sin in Sodom. The Bible goes on and tells us in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, it says that Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside of her door. Sodom was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out as you have seen. You may not be struggling with sexual immorality, but are you struggling with pride? Are you struggling with gluttony? Are you struggling with laziness? What about gossip? What about gossip? Come on, y'all, I grew up in church. Hey, I need to know all the details so I know how to pray. No, that's gossip. You don't need to know all the details. You just need to know that that person's hurting and they need some Jesus and so you can pray. What about gossip? What about slander? What about slander? I got some good Christian people in my family that I love with everything inside of my heart because they're my family, they're my blood, but I've heard them say some terrible things about our president. Oh, we got quiet, Pastor Austin. I've heard them say some terrible things about people in the government. Are you struggling with slander? Are you struggling with unforgiveness? What about unforgiveness? You don't know what they did to me, Pastor August. You don't know how bad they've hurt me. Yeah, but it was your sins that held Jesus to the cross. It was your sins that put the scars on his back. It was your sins that drove the thorns into his brow. And he forgave you. Even when you didn't choose it, even when you were still his enemy, he forgave you. What about unforgiveness? Is there somebody you need to forgive? Is there somebody you need to ask for forgiveness from? Where in your life do you resemble Sodom? This one's hard. Are you so worried about gathering wealth and status that the poor and needy are going hungry outside of your door? Where in your life do you resemble Sodom? 
Where in your life have you gotten comfortable with sin? Where in your life have you began to tolerate things and it's seeping into your home, it's seeping into your mind, it's seeping into your community and you know, if I continue to, if I continue to tolerate this, if I continue to become comfortable with this, it's gonna break me and it's gonna break my relationship with God and so I need to surrender it to Him today. Church, I'm challenging you to step out of your seats here in just a moment and surrender them to the, at the altar because we know where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and we know that Jesus died on the cross to grant you forgiveness and to grant you freedom and you can experience that this morning you don't have to continue to suffer in sin you don't have to continue to tolerate sin you don't have to continue to live separate from God he's here he's moving he wants to do a work in your life the second way the second way that we respond to this story as we ask, God, who do I need to intercede for? Who do I need to intercede for? What neighbor do you need to begin to have a conversation with Jesus about? And it's not like, yo, Jesus, this neighbor, oh, they get under my skin, Jesus. I let them borrow my shovel three years ago, they never give it back. No, but it's the conversation that says, God, they're hurting. God, they're angry and they treat me with anger, but I know it's because there's something deep inside that they're hurting from. So Jesus, I just pray that you would have mercy on their souls. And I pray that you would use me as a tool in your hand to build your kingdom, to reach out to my neighbor, to love them as myself like your word says. What neighbor do you need to begin to have a conversation with Jesus about? What family member do you need to surrender at Jesus' feet this morning? What coworker needs to know the hope that you found in Jesus? Who do you need to intercede for, church? And if you say, nobody, I ain't got all my friends are saved, all my neighbors are saved, all my family saved, praise God. You live in a community that you need to intercede for. You live in a state that needs to be interceded for. You live in a world that needs somebody, a believer in Jesus who says, I'm willing to stand in the gap and, pre and believe that God can and will use me to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in my community, to make a difference at my workplace. Who do you need to intercede for? This morning, I'm challenging all of you to respond. Would you close your eyes with me? Maybe you need to come down to the altar and surrender the sin that's in your heart. For the very first time, or for the first time in a long time, you've, God has began to speak to you. These are the places that you are living separated from me. These are the things that you've begun to tolerate, that you've become comfortable with, and I'm asking you to surrender them this morning. And it, I believe that when we, we take a step outwardly and physically towards Jesus, it seals what he's doing inside of our hearts. And so I'm asking you to take a step physically this morning out of your comfort zone and to this altar here in just a moment. What sin do you need to surrender to Jesus? And maybe, Maybe you need to come down to the altar and ask God to transform your heart so that you can begin to see people the way that he sees people and so that you can begin to love people the way that he loves people and so that he can develop in you a heart of intercession so that you can intercede for your family, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, for your community. Even if or especially if there's a person you don't currently enjoy. There's a person you don't currently like. There's a person. Who's that person? That's probably the person you need to begin to intercede, intercede for. So I'm gonna ask you to do something this morning. If you are here today and you would say, Pastor August, that's me. 
I have sin that I need to surrender or I need to surrender my heart to God so that I can become an intercessor. I'm gonna ask you to step out of your comfort zone, to step out of your pew and come to this altar. I'm gonna pray and when I say amen, we're gonna sing this song and I'm gonna ask you when I say amen to respond to this altar this morning because I believe, like I said, when we take a step physically, it seals what God is doing internally. So God, I pray that you would speak to all of our hearts. God, I pray that you would give all of us uh, the boldness to step out, the boldness to respond, the boldness to surrender, and the boldness to become intercessors. God, I pray that you would use every person in this place as a tool in your hand to reach lost people, to reach out to people that you love, that you have grace, that you have mercy for. God, use us. I pray that we would surrender our hearts to you. Jesus, use us this morning. In your name we pray, let's respond.